just confirming you receive the notification yes perfect thank you so thanks very much everyone for joining us today uh, i think i've met many of you who have joined us but for those of you who have not yet met, met me i'm joanna batstone and i am the director of the monash data futures institute and i will be your host and moderator today now, before we start, even though we are not physically gathered here today, uh, I do wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on whose land we're in essence virtually gathered today. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Welcome to our second Monash Data Futures Institute meetup of the year. For those of you who joined us last time as well, you'll know that this is a new experiment and a new format that we're conducting to help drive engagement across a group of researchers with a mutual interest in data science and AI, and in particular with respect to new ways of thinking about the implications of technology for the future. And so I'm very pleased today that we've been able to persuade Professor John Grundy to join us. John is an Australian Laureate Fellow and also a Professor of Software Engineering within the Faculty of IT at Monash. Uh, and John has a, a, a long list of accolades and awards and recommendations, but to list just a few, uh, he's a fellow of Automated Software Engineering, a fellow of Engineers Australia, Certified Professional Engineer, Engineering Executive Member of the ACM and Senior Member of the IEEE. Uh, John is also relatively new to Monash. So John joined Monash in 2018 uh, and has been the Senior Deputy Dean for the Faculty of IT at Monash. And then in the past previous roles at Deakin University as the Pro Vice Chancellor of ICT Innovation and Translation, and also Dean of the School of Software and Electrical Engineering at Swinburne University. And as you also heard reference for those of you who joined and had the pleasure of watching some of John's uh, photographs, um, comes from New Zealand. And so I'm sure we'll hear lots of interesting stories through this afternoon. So in John's Laureate Fellowship role now at Monash, John's been researching new approaches to engineering software systems, particularly taking into account the human aspects of end users and team members and looking at new ways to capture and use human-centric software requirements during model software engineering and verification as well. So we're very excited to have John, John join us today for this second Monash Data Futures Institute meetup. Um, before I hand over to John, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, clearly, as in addition to recording, we are hoping to drive this as a very interactive, dynamic conversation and discussion. Uh, John's going to kick off the session with some introductory comments and remarks and provocative uh, questions for all of us. And then we will switch into a moderated Q&A session. And uh, so what I would ask is keep yourselves on mute as we start the uh, project, the, uh, the afternoon session here. But then when we move into the Q&A session, please feel free to raise your hands, come off mute, put your videos on and engage in a conversation with us hosted and facilitated by myself and John. And we're looking forward to a, an interesting afternoon session here. So thanks very much to all of you for joining us again this week. And we'll get started now. And John, thank you again for joining and over to you. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Joanna. I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners of the lands that um, we're meeting on today virtually um, I, for me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, uh, I acknowledge their elders past, present, emerging and future. I particularly want to acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person um, meeting with us today. Um, I'm just attempting to share my screen. Um, bear with me while I do that. Is that presenting? <laughs> um, can you can you see my slides? We can. Okay, great. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, when I've been to meetups before, I've actually met people like in person. I've never done a meetup virtually, actually. Um, I got so sick of Zooms last year, I, I didn't didn't really want to attend any virtually. So it's an interesting experience. So um, what I was going to do, I'll just 
go on to the next slide. I'll um, tell you briefly about my lab, very briefly. So I'll just spend a few minutes on this. Um, and then tell you a little bit about the work we're doing. Again, I'll, I'll make that pretty brief. Now I actually want to throw up a whole bunch of questions about uh, engineering AI-based systems. Um, and that's where I think the conversation, you know, I can either throw the whole lot up together um, or I've got three chunks so we can always deal with them in three chunks, if you like, which roughly relate to kind of key parts of software development. Um, so this is who we are. When I, when I got my laureate fellowship, the dean at that time said to me, oh, you, a laureate fellow has to have his own lab. So here you go, you have a lab. So that's nice. Um, so we, we're trying to create software for the diverse human community is kind of the big kind of catchphrase up there. Um, and you can see the mission, vision, and, and um, whatever the thing is I can't see underneath my other gold. Um, and there's some ways we do it down the bottom. There's no, no, no other particular reason I want to show you this. And yet we took ages to come up with this uh, last year in a very iterative way. And of course, we couldn't meet, so it was all done virtually. But I'm, I'm quite proud. So this is actually an A0 poster we stick on the wall if you come down to visit us in 79P. Actually, we eventually we'll put it on the wall. Um, this is the team. So me and Rashina are kind of the academic leaders, and I've got quite a number of postdocs and the whole stack of about, probably about 20 odd PhDs now. We've still got a few more um, to recruit uh, as well. And um, they, they all come from kind of diverse backgrounds. Um, you can see there's kind of a bit of gender diversity, which is kind of unusual <laughs> in, um, in software engineering. Um, we've also got some good ethnic diversity there and some age diversity. Um, there's actually some physical and mental challenge diversity uh, if it's not um, apparent. Um, and we've got some, some kind of um, discipline um, diversity too. So people here come from uh, quite different um, uh, research backgrounds. Some are more technically oriented, some more socio-technical, some are from a software background, some more from HCI, a couple are from a health area, one from psychology and so on. Um, Oh, whoops, I'll go back. Um, I want to talk briefly about um, how humans turn up in the software engineering process. So um, this kind of thing in the background is this little kind of diagram I used to use when I was teaching software engineering to computer science students. Um, and I put these little faces here, which kind of show the places humans are involved. So we, we write code, which is usually the kind of typical way we think about it. We do design. But we also have to gather requirements from users. So um, you have to you have to kind of talk to people. And um, is it, there's a lot of kind of human interaction that go on that needs to go on there to make that effective. And um, we have to work together in teams. Um, we need to give humans tools to develop software. And I'm actually going to show you a couple of very brief examples of ones we've developed. Um, and then humans use software. And that's actually the one I'm in this in this lab and project most interested in is how we better engineer software for end users. Although the human aspects of software engineers and uh, dare I say, AI folks and data scientists um, are pretty interesting as well. And I'll maybe come back to that. Uh, all right. So what happens when you don't um, take full cognizance of um, the humans that are involved in the development and the, the using of the software? Well, we get all these kind of biases. So just some examples. Um, the seatbelt one's pretty terrible. So seatbelts are designed for average size men. Now, why is that? Because all the crash dummies are average size men. Um, so that's why we've got a problem, not, not just for women, but not average size men. Um, a lot of health apps um, are, are designed and built by men and they kind of forget things like, dare I say, menstrual cycles and, and other things that are important to, to, to non-men. Um, a lot of interfaces actually, um, there's, there's a number of, um, studies that show uh, men and women have different problem solving strategies. And because most user interfaces are designed and built by men, lo and behold, they have a male oriented problem solving strategy. So a very interesting toolkit being developed by a, a good colleague of mine called Gender Mag or Gender Magnifier, which you can point at a, a website or an app and figuratively it's a, it's a manual tool at the moment um, and find the gender biases. Um, and, and, and dare I say, a lot of them have it. Um, ethnic bias, we've, we've kind of heard about a whole bunch of outrageous examples of, of um, very bad face recognition, um, uh, prioritizing minorities for, for police surveillance and all these kind of things. Um, lots of examples of cultural bias. Some of it you might say is sort of, or think of as a little trivial, but in fact, um, it tends to disengage and, dare I say, insult and belittle uh, people of different cultures and, and um, with all the, the bad consequences that has. 
a language bias, you know, software is written by people that are highly educated and love to use lots of jargon and it creeps its way into the, the software end users have to try and put up with. A lot of age bias, we're actually doing some work on an age mag or age magnifier, looking at the age bias, uh, both young and old in, in software at the moment, one of, one of our research projects. Um, there's a lot of problems that people have using software that doesn't take into account of their cognitive and physical challenges. So um, trying to use a gesture interface when you've got low motor, motor control skills. Um, if you're hard of hearing or unhearing, um, and uh, then there's a lot of software that raises anxiety of users. We did a study of smart homes for elderly, and um, one of the major problems there is, is actually making elderly people who have a smart home feel much more anxious and unsupported and, and, and having it being overbearing and, and um, loss of control and so on. Um, I, what I call enjoyment bias. <laughs> Most people like to have fun when doing things, work and leisure and so on. And a lot of stuff is just plain boring. Um, and unengaged and distracting. So things like gamification, some other, other techniques trying to address that. Um, again, emotional bias, very interested in this one. This is where the software causes um, painful emotions to be exacerbated or, or manifested and, and good emotions to be downplayed or not played up enough. So how do you, how do you deal with those? And we, we've got work going on in that area too. Been interested in personality bias for a long time. So I have some theses around different personality types work in different ways and work in different ways together. So we've studied that in the context of software testing, uh, requirements engineering, we've got a student looking at it at the moment, done team climate, which is sort of how teams work together and personality clashes and teams and then there's many others. Um, and yeah, so, so again, I, I want to emphasize this can apply to the team, but also the users. And, and, and also again, when you've got teams of software developers trying to work with users, you get them having to be dealt with together as well. Give an example of, um, this is software I produced a long time ago with a student. Um, there's a care plan on the, on the left. There's actually a graphical interface. You can build these things within the tool. And um, you can, in this case, model an obesity care plan management strategy with a whole kind of different therapies. And uh, you put a whole bunch of information in these nice models and you press a button and it produces this nice app. Well, it's not so nice anymore. That's a, a flash actually implementation that was generated. Um, so it's all good. Um, and oh, by the way, that's used, uh, the clinicians, the hospital, the doctors can, um, and nurses can actually specify this. So it's an end user um, software creation tool. Unfortunately, it fails to take into account a whole bunch of differences that users have. So just some of the ones I talked about before, uh, age, gender, culture, language, and so on. So you end up with a one size fits all uh, implementation, which has got lots of problems for a whole bunch of the end user, ironically, the target end user base uh, for this software. Okay. Um, so how are we tackling this? So um, in, in our lab, we're, we're creating a, a co-creational living lab situation where we try and treat all of the participants as first-class citizens, not the them and us. We typically get in software teams of them being users and us being software engineers. Um, we're using a set of uh, visual languages predominantly to model a whole wide range of um, not just functional and non-functional requirements and designs, but the human aspects at the requirements and design levels. We're synthesizing um, using model-driven engineering techniques, but like the previous example I showed you, uh, implementation, sometimes multiple implementations of the same app, you know, tailored for, for different uh, end user characteristics, and trying to give what I call a more human-centric feedback loop. Um, so you can rapidly diagnose uh, problems in the software and, and address that. And dare I say, this approach might work kind of nice for AI-based software systems. In fact, I have a project um, using this model exactly for that. Um, so, oops. Um, so what I want to do now is sort of talk about um, three areas, requirements, engineering, design, and building software, and um, fixing bugs. Um, and I've posed a number of questions. Um, in these areas, some are kind of generic ones, but some I've tried to tailor them to kind of AI based data based big database solutions. And I've got a couple of examples of, um, of work we've been doing that try to address some of these. So um, here's some questions. And again, um, I'll show you an example. And then perhaps we can either come back to this, um, Joanna and discuss these ones. And then I've got a couple more groups of questions, if you like, that we might go on to other other sort of aspects of engineering systems. So 
how do we do requirements engine for AI? So ironically, I have a student working on exactly, I think that's exactly her PhD title, um, but that's unknown at the moment. Who are the stakeholders in, in such a system? Um, and stakeholders are not just end users. So there's people that are like managers and suppliers of data um, that might not be consumers of the end software product. How do they influence the board? We might have anti-stakeholders who don't want the system built. The system uh, will interfere with kind of things they do or the way they do it, or they might be threatened by it or whatever and might get in its way. Um, how do, you, how do you figure out what they need um, and how do the different human aspects I just outlined impact those? Uh, we've got lots of examples where those human aspects were not considered appropriate at appropriate times and appropriate ways and problems have occurred. Um, how, do we, how, do we just, how do we have a conversation with these different stakeholders? How do we model these things so we don't forget about them? Um, dare I say, software engineers and probably data scientists are different from state for most of the stakeholders. Um, how do their differences impact the engineering of solutions. Um, so we attract a certain class of person to software engineering present company accepted. Um, sometimes their human human interfaces aren't the best, dare I say. Um, and sometimes the way they think and behave is not at all typical of your kind of average software end user. And this is highly problematic for them engineering fit for purpose software. And then um, I do wonder, and we have got projects looking at these things. In fact, I've having a dialogue with Data61 very soon about this area, um, uh, software engineering for AI and AI for software engineering. So um, we're using a number of kind of what I call AI or intelligent systems based techniques to try and help us solve some of these issues, finding human centric requirements, um, finding their absence or incompleteness, um, trying to present that information in a proactive way to end users, stakeholders, software engineers, to help them address it. Just give you one example um, of work we're doing. So this is um, one of the diagrams of several. This is a domain-specific visual language. So it's a modeling language. In this case, it's for modeling big data-based solutions. So you've got your AI ops and your DevOps and business ops and so on. Um, this is a traffic simulation model we did with Vic Road. So it's taken a whole bunch of road data and traffic modeling data and sensor data. And it's trying to synthesize a, a predictive model to help Vic Roads engineers better understand traffic flows at different times and impacted by different events and hopefully make more intelligent decisions about controlling the roads, planning the roads, all that kind of stuff. So the idea of this, this visual language uh, might be interesting for this audience. So it's targeted at, at quite a multidisciplinary audience. It's not for software engineers. In fact, it's actually for data scientists, but also end users. We, we can explain these models and we've got a bunch of other ones um, relatively straightforwardly. And we've got some empirical studies that show that. Um, software engineers can take it and use it to help them implement AI-based solutions, but data scientists who are not software engineers can also uh, uh, feed in um, particular kind of you know, feature selection processes and predictive algorithm processes, data cleansing, data visualization, and so on. And um, uh, platform engineers, things like, like cloud engineers and so on, can also use some of the, uh, the models to decide how to massively scale um, some of the solutions to handle large scale um, deployment and so on. So um, Joanne, I don't know if we want to have a little bit of talk about the requirements side of things. As I say, I've got some more detailed things, but this, this might be an interesting starting point for a little bit of a discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, so, so team, you know, if, if any of you have questions, please raise your hands if any of you would like to answer any of the questions that John, John has on the slide, then uh, please raise your hands as well. Um, I might just kick off, John, um, with a question here, because you've, you've raised a conversation here around stakeholders and, and basically, you know, in essence, a sort of difference in the profile and makeup of the developers, engineers, scientists from perhaps the recipients of the output of that work. And so is that, is that, I mean, I hate to say the word straightforward, but is that as straightforward as saying, look, we don't have enough diversity in our uh, population of data scientists, software engineers and practitioners, because that practitioner group doesn't represent the population as a whole, or is that just too simplistic a way of thinking of it? You know, well, in that slide I showed at the very start, one of those boxes is we need to diversify the workforce. And in that case, it was software engineering, but I'd apply it to computer science in general. Um, 
So yeah, and I think one of the issues is we need to attract a representative set of, um, I'll call them engineers, maybe that's not strictly accurate, um, to build these um, uh, solutions, because I think that will actually improve the situation a lot. The example, the outrageous one I gave of only men building the Apple Health app and, and forgetting completely that, you know, um, a woman user might want to track a menstrual cycle as, as, a, as an example. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 just amazing some of these things get forgotten. But then when you think about the the, the lack of diversity in the team, it, it really does highlight um, these huge gaps um, in, in that um, capacity base that we have. Um, again, I think um, there's a, a recent article in IEEE Software about the bias against aging software engineers. So how poorly they're treated and spoken about by, you know, because most software engineers tend to be in their 20s and 30s. I don't know what happens when you get to your fifties. You know, it may be becoming an academic. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I used to be a, a professional software engineer many years ago. Um, but um, again, I, I think um, we have some severe workforce diversity problems, and, and I'm sure it applies to data science as well as software engineering. Um, I think it's only one part of the issue, though. Um, so again, I think um, some of these things I talk about ways to elicit model, even be prompted, have you thought about users with this challenge, for example, have you thought about the software being used in this cultural context or language context or socioeconomic context or whatever, um, and um, giving software engineers tools, and I'll come into the, the next one, I'll talk about design implementation, I think will help a lot of those things, but we don't have them at the moment. Yeah, great, thanks John. We've got a question here from Emmy Tanaka. Emmy, do you want to go ahead? And then we've got Naren after that. And then Shanti has a question in the chat. So let's tee up those next three questions. Emmy, over to you. Hey, thanks, Joanna. Um, and thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to kind of ask, so like my background is statistics and I do a lot of software development these days, um, mostly in like really, so one of the things I do actually is that they're trying to make a, a subsystem at the moment a package which actually implements experimental design. And I'm thinking about how it interacts with the user. How do the users think and how can it help their statistical thinking in actually specifying mm -hmm. experimental design? So I actually was a bit um, really curious about your talk. Um, in some sense, I, I actually was also curious when you are implementing this human-centric approach um, to yours, um, like, do you, like how do you validate what's working and what's not working? So one of the projects I did in New Zealand was called the Statistics Design Language. I actually did it with a statistician at the University of Auckland, um, um, Ross E. Harker, who, who in fact one of the inventors of R. Yeah, um, oh, wow. Was my um, co-supervised a master's student. Um, but um, that particular one was um, the idea that in statistics, there isn't a, a, you know, so when you're designing a statistical study, so we built a bunch of languages to describe how you go about the different stages in designing a statistical study all the way from you know kind of why you're doing it to population sampling to the kind of um you know various kind of statistical algorithms you might use to analyze that and then to presenting the results in the report or whatever um and that student built a tool and we evaluated it with some a bunch of end users and all, all statisticians actually um and so in our work we um we try and engage with domain experts so the the, the in fact this slide bitamore was inspired by sdl <laughs> so you know, there's 15 years difference or nearly in them but um yeah, this is this is a descendant of that statistics design language and sdl tool work um so yeah engage with domain experts um try uh, my i've always been interested in how do you raise up the abstraction levels rather than coding everything in low levels um one of, one of my aims by the way is to get rid of software engineers um and i'll come back to that person the following slide with an example that that tool i showed you that the doctor could generate an app for the patient to manage their obesity is a classic example that's an end user development tool um sadly with some lacking of a lot of human aspects but never mind um then we do evaluations with engineers. So I've got I've got a huge number of user evaluations I've done over the years uh, on the tools that we've developed. Uh, we've built a bunch of software tools, so we use software engineers, but we've built a bunch of end user oriented tools and visualizations and stuff. So we use kind of end users of some sort. Um, we don't tend to evaluate with stakeholders, which is perhaps a gap. So I mentioned, and and I think Joanna flagged, you know, there's a bunch of people involved in wanting to build these kind of AI based systems. Um, and some of them aren't users and they're not developers, it's something else, but they do influence it greatly. And how to get them involved in the evaluation is an interesting 
question. We have some evaluation frameworks um, that we use. So they come, some come from psychology, some come from computer science and software engineering, and we develop some of our own. Of our own. So I had a student develop um, a new taxonomy for usability defect classification. Um, so I won't talk about today, but um, it, it, it's used to classify usability defects and in interfaces um, and uh, makes a major advance on the existing one. The existing one's actually really old. So that you can't even express in the existing frameworks problems with your touch screen because they were invented before the days of smartphones. <laughs> so how, how good is that for a defect classification language? It can't even manage all the new kinds of interfaces we have now. Um, so in your example, I'd say engage deeply with your target users to understand what they're trying to do, um, how they want to go about it. They're probably not statisticians. So how do you get probably quite complex statistical theories and practices to them in a way that they can comprehend in order to be able to solve their um, issues. And then how do you do some user studies with them to see where they're having problems? And, and that living lab loop I mentioned, you know, that kind of treat them as a first-class citizen in your development, not just some user that comes at the end or something like that. How do you, how do you get them involved all the way through to um, co-developing co a solution with you? So partly I'm curious, um, maybe because also my background in statistics is that, you know, so you collect information, but in terms of actually validating and analyzing it, like I was wondering whether there was some specific methods that you were using actually to... Well, it depends what the data is um, that you're trying to, to validate. So in, in, um, in our studies, it's usually data um, either around the using of a tool or a model or a language or a process um, and so there are there are a number of, you know, again, um, some of them from computer science, a couple of them some psychology that we use to help us frame and understand them. Um, if it's a particular, you know, machine learning or statistical model, then there's there's typically some kind of um, approach or method that's been developed by that guy. I'm not I'm not a statistician nor a machine learning person, so I I usually try and work with people who've got expertise in those areas um, to know what are the right ones. Um, to use there but if you're interested in you know usability evaluation for example there's really great psychology and hci frameworks that have been developed um, and they're they're well described and, and well understood and um, usually finding an example of one used on a, on a system similar to yours i find is the best way to figure out how to operationalize them for my own work great thanks john thanks Amy, for the question i, I think next up with naren like to go ahead with your question yeah thank you uh, uh i'm a data science student right now and i'm taking my last semester and it's an industry studio project and they focus on uh, when it comes to uh, taking the requirements uh they usually focus on uh, empathy mapping and design thinking aspects and that's what uh, kind of is the main focus there and i was wondering whether is that enough or is there um, so that comes at the very start? But what are the other kinds of generic, uh, uh, more so, um, so look, requirements engineering is a really long studied um, area, and there's a whole bunch of techniques. There's goal modeling. Um, there's um, person personas um, which are inherited from HCI and design. Um, there is uh, modeling kind of the structural aspects and then the behavioral aspects, and then there's modeling non-functional aspects. So in software engineering, we've developed a whole pile of processes, techniques, and tools over many, many years to, to capture requirements. Um, one of the gaps <laughs> is the human aspects. So in fact, I've just had a student um, uh, publish a paper on um, you know, studies on the human aspects of um, uh, uh, impacting requirements engineering and again it's an area that there has been some work done but but it's actually pretty patchy and quite a lot of those human aspects has have never been from a software engineering point of view studied in terms of how you understand them how you integrate them into your development processes how, how you realize them when it comes to design how do you test against them and so on so it's, that's an area we're trying to kind of fill some of those um yeah, so again, I'll go back to the, the answer I gave uh, to, to um, Jamie that, um, you know, deeply involving your stakeholder slash end user community or representatives of them in your development processes is, is absolutely critical. Okay, thank you. 
Great, thanks, John. I think next uh, next in order was Shanti, and then uh, then after Shanti, I think Mark Howard is next on the list. Over to you, Shanti. Thanks, Joanna. Hi, John. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I'm a social scientist. I'm a human geographer, so I should out myself before I pose my question. <laughs> um, but but I suppose it relates both to what you just said about human factors, I guess. Um, and also what you're talking about in terms of diversity of the teams of people who develop, you know, the kinds of applications and the sort of work that you do. So I wondered how you collaborate with, um, you know, and, and every discipline has its own methodologies for trying to get at yeah. perhaps similar questions. But certainly from where I sit, there are a lot of, um, you know, very, very qualitative and ethno even ethnographic methodologies that try to get to not just um, what what requirements might be, but how how any sort of technology is kind of woven into our lives, yeah, yeah. you know, at many different points, um, and also through development and design processes, how that can be folded in throughout, you know, for sort of from starting from before to going to after, you know, so throughout the whole process. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, your thoughts about interdisciplinary collaboration. I mean, that's one of the kind of goals of the DFI as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, um, so I had and, a meeting with And working Sarah, with social scientists in particular. Yeah, well, I had a meeting with Sarah Pink and Yolanda String is... Um, Who I work with, yeah. Yeah, um, and Sarah taught me the thing to call them people. So they don't, they're not called users or humans, we call them people. So I, I try and always call them people. Um, yeah. And I'm being, being inspired by Sarah. And the other thing, um, Sarah and I are working on a, a center of excellence um, yeah. proposal at the moment and the other thing she's also reminded me of what if people don't know what they want and in fact what if they're on the wrong thing so this is that that kind of more ethnographic sort of the big picture just because we can build and in fact i believe myself just because we can build something doesn't mean we should build it so what will be the unintended consequences um, and some of these things here you know we've probably seen some unintended consequences of, of ai based solutions we've oh great let's have an app to do blah blah and then people have misused it or or Again, it's had terrible biases or, you know, uh, lots of limitations because um, it didn't take into the full count of, you know, humans as individuals, humans as collectives, um, society, etc. So I think um, I think we have a lot to learn as a technologist from from the social sciences and dare I say the humanities as well. You know, history is a great teacher if only we'd listen to it. Um, we might make some of our mistakes yet again um, in some of these areas. Um, so I've, I've worked with um, quite a range of people in other disciplines. Um, again, it comes back to that living lab. How do you treat everybody exactly the same in terms of not, not everyone's the same same, but they're the same value, um, if you like. And computer scientists and software engineers, in my experience, have got into that area because they like building things. Um, so often they'll jump, they'll jump too quickly into the design part, and then they're not too interested in the fixing part, the, the dare I say, the maintenance. and evolution that's um let's use some cool to cool new technology to build a cool new idea and go away and do something else um and that forgets this bit in the bit i'll talk about at the end if we have time but how do you fix the mistakes we've, we've made and i find other disciplines are a bit more holistic um, um yeah, again they might spend a bit more time on, on sort of thinking through some of these issues and understanding in more depth and they've got techniques that enable them to do that some of them that have been invented you know decades if not more ago and uh, they're also more interested in, okay, once we've put this thing into the wild, what are those consequences? And they're not always good. And, and then how do we deal with those? And um, uh, us technologists perhaps need a bit more of that, you know, upfront thinking and at the end thinking. Thanks. Thanks. So, John, a question somewhat related, but, but really targeting how do you do, in essence, conflict, conflict resolution when, when people just don't agree. A uh, question from Mark Howard. Mark, do you want to engage here? Yeah, cheers. Uh, so thank you, John. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, seeing Shanti outed herself as a social scientist, I should probably out myself as a political philosopher and ethicist. Um, so I'm really curious, you know, obviously it's great that we're having this conversation around um, human-centered design and awareness of impacts, um, social, etc. One of the, the big problems, I guess, we're confronting, and I'm, I'm curious about the approach from a sort of software perspective, is how we resolve value conflicts um, amongst end users or between designers and users or 
um, even between, say, your clients and users? Uh, have you got a, a sort of systematized approach to that or a, a, a way of thinking about that at the moment? Um, no, <laughs> but uh, we do have um, we have a values project. I inherited that from John Whittle, um, and so I've, I've kind of looking after the um, the operationalizing values team in, in my humanized lab. Um, so we have a number of projects looking at um, values and requirements, values and design. In fact, just work on some stuff today on that, and um, also also detecting values violations or defects, if you prefer. Uh, so we've got some work we've done that, that finds some of those as expressed by different kinds of users. Um, one of the problems you're going to encounter is um, sometimes it's, it's an over-constrained problem. There's, it cannot be resolved, so it becomes a trade-off. Um, and it might be you live with some things that you'd rather not live with, but you can kind of do it or less, cause less, less, least amount of harm kind of thing. It might be we shouldn't do this at all. Um, so I think we do get ourselves in a number of situations where it's impossible to resolve those differences in, in values. Um, you know, some, some humans that we might want to have using our software, it's just going to be too difficult or too expensive to provide them that. Um, and um, then there might be situations where um, we, we've got this data, we'd like to use it for this purpose, but we don't have the right consent um, to do that. Um, so we could do this, but, you know, for various you know, constraints, uh, we, we can't. So I think we, we naturally get ourselves into those situations. Again, um, I think it's trying to resolve, they're trying to identify them as quickly as possible and then see what mitigations might exist is, is better than producing something and finding the problems down the track. Um, in, in software engineering, we, we have this adage about testing that you know, picking up problems during testing is far more expensive to fix and say if we pick them up at requirements or at design time. I think, again, these these other sorts of issues are, are similar. You know, the earlier you pick them up, the better. Um, they can't always be resolved, though. Thanks, John. There's a question from Andrew, and, and then after Andrew, we might hand back to you, John, for some other thoughts. Design time, yep, sure, yep. Question. So one more question from Andrew and then back to John. Andrew, you're on mute. There you go. Sorry about that. Thanks, John. Really loving this presentation, the whole idea of um, software designing it from um, uh, human uh, back. I mean, one of the slides that you presented got me thinking, um, and particularly as you described it, with the one size fits all software implementation problem and then unintended con consequences. I guess my question is how do we get computers or machines, for that matter, or the software that runs them to learn? more about what we really want, either from observations or the choices we make and how we make them. I've got some answers to that one, maybe not. I've got more questions <laughs> directly related to on the following slides. So, so in fact, again, um, a couple of the areas we work on adaptable interfaces and, and one way is to have it manually. So I say, oh, I've gone color blind, make the colors change, uh, make the font bigger. I'm dyslexic, so give me a or dyslexic friendly font or simplified language, blah, blah, blah. Um, or, you know, could we have some AI based capability that detects that? Um, one of the ones I'm interested, we're not working on it right now, but I would like to work on is detecting stress uh, in the users and then trying to modify how the software interacts. There might be the dialogue that's going through, that might be the UI or dialogue that's a chatbot or whatever. Um, perhaps presenting things in a different way, de stressifying. So, so, Figuring out, we're trying to do a complex task, so we'll do a simpler one. So, so in education and so on, those things are. Kind of, there's been some work done on that. So, I'm quite interested in those ideas, trying to incorporate um, understanding the user's current state of mind, if you will, or the context of use, and then um, using appropriate um, uh, AI, um, if you'd like, um, support in the software to to try and adapt it at runtime while it's in use to address some of those issues. Great question, yeah. All right, um, so without further ado then, design. So how do we support these diverse end users, diverse data models, algorithms? Um, how do we present actionable results um, to users? I actually might have an example at the end of that related to defects. Um, how do we adapt the solutions? That was just what I was talking about and, and, and answered Andrew's question. So we've got all these different cognitive styles, language, culture, age, et cetera. Um, how do we come up with the design, but 
an implementation and maybe an implementation that can change while it's in use at runtime. Um, can we let people change it themselves? I mentioned the adaptable interface where I might reconfigure things, but um, can they do more sophisticated change? In fact, I'm going to show you an example of one of those. Um, who, who, who needs software engineers? Who needs data scientists anyway? Just give them tools that they can do it themselves. And again, I think um, Emmy's question got to that, you know, like, um, how do we give people, you know, stats building solutions where we get rid of statisticians as well, we then add them to the collection. Um, how do we detect um, issues? And again, this probably directly addresses Andrew's uh, issue and, and adapt the software. And um, it's a very hard problem to do automatically, but but I am very interested in that. But um, semi-automatically, I think is um, you know, where there's a combination of, of human in the loop, if you will, of doing that. Um, and what happens if our models change? So I've just had a PhD at Deakin finish, very interesting project studying computer vision services, the cloud-based computer vision and um, how they change over time. So exactly the same inputs to the computer vision service give you totally different outputs, you know, different probabilities, classifications, um, uh, identification of, of elements and so on. Um, so these non-deterministic things, so, so software, software, most software engineers don't understand that. We don't train them much in it. Um, and so when they're using all these AI-based natural language processing ones are the same kind of problems. Um, they use these services and they kind of look like standard services because you call them the same way from the code and you stick them in the design the same way but they're not they're totally different um behind the scenes and so um, um we studied how people discuss them on stack overflow and we came up with an architecture to try and address some some issues with evolving uh, computer vision services we hope to generalize it to other ai based services um Give you a couple of feels for stuff we've been doing in this space. Um, here's an end user data visualization. We're on visualizing data. So in fact, this one, the one I've got in front of me is actually doing data transformation, but it's saying, so I'm doing data cleansing, if you will, or transforming it to shove it into an algorithm. Um, it's using a 2D structure on the left from a CAD tool, and it's using a tree-based structure on the right um, from some other tool. Um, so, um, so it can also show data in interesting ways. Um, it's got a whole bunch of, um, formulae for all those are the things in the top right, those little bubbly things to do all the transformations. You can transform model to model, model to visualization. It's even sophisticated enough we can build a Minard map. So if you've ever done visualization work, you know, can your tool build a Minard map? Yes, our, can, our tool can. So the Minard map is, by the way, when Napoleon and the Grande Armée tried to invade um, Russia, a really bad idea, as a number of people have found out. And the, the red is his army shrinking over time as it got to Moscow and the black is on retreat. There's not much left of it by the time it got back. And um, this, this visualization of the Minard map, um, which is a pretty good one actually, you can interact with even and, and drill down. And there's a drill down on the on another, another uh, end user specified um, pie chart visualization. Isn't that cool? Uh, it's all 100% code generation. It's actually not a code generation, it's an interpreter, but 100% code generation. So there's no software engineer, no, no statistician no data visualization person, it's all done by the end users. And we've, we've used this in a bunch of industry projects. Um, oh, that's the one for that. Um, so again, um, I think this design and implementation level is, is really interesting. Um, do we need tools like the one I just showed you? We just sort of kind of get these developers and data scientists out of the loop and let the users go to it? Um, or do we need ways to, uh, you know, kind of incorporate, you know, um, the non-deterministic nature of AI-based solutions, the, dare I say, dare I say the non-deterministic nature of humans um, into this? Do we need to better support um, um, accessibility? Again, language, culture, gender, challenges that the users have uh, much better in design and implementation. Thoughts from, thoughts from the data scientists and AI folks? Questions, anyone? I know, BJ, you've got a comment in the chat about language sensitivity and should we be thinking and even using different words in the way we describe software development? Do you want to chime in here? BJ Paul? Yep, sure, thanks, Joanna. So hi, John. Uh, I'm, uh, I work with Joanna's team. Uh, I'm, uh, I work in comms, but then apart from a day job, one stuff I do is uh, user experience writing. So I help you know, certain businesses do their stuff. And just thinking on those lines, I find it interesting when you said that now we're using people and you know, not users, that really stuck. 
Do you know if you can do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Excuse the users on the slide. Yeah. No, no, right, right. Like, I, I really found that interesting because uh, like recently one like one of the things which I've also been focusing around is you know inclusivity in language. Mm. So if you consider that factor and you know being sensitive around what language you use, what terminologies you use, now how do you ensure that even when you're building building these models, building these systems? We are not alienating, let's say, a group of people, or we are not being insensitive. So, like, you know, as an example, what I've written is uh, recently a lot of tech companies have been, you know, changing the terminologies they have been using like, even for decades. So, Twitter and Rupal, they removed, they, and along with lots of other companies, they removed the usage of master and slave. Uh, Android and Google Chromium, they have removed blacklist and whitelist, and they have changed it to blocklist and allowlist. So in terms of you know even that starting process of building systems, uh, you know, uh, is it like how are we ensuring that you know from that phase itself, you know, we are being sensitive even in the littlest of um, things? Yeah, look, so so it manifests into it. So you you've given a couple of good you know, kind of top of examples. We've got another one where I've, I've um, got a research fellow who's just writing up a study on um, gender bias and job ads. So it gets back to Joanna's thing. So. Um, our software engineering job ads are incredibly gender biased still. So if we want to attract, you know, like um, young women in high school to say being software engineers and yet they go and look at some ads and seek and they're full of all these male oriented terms and so on. Um, and by the way, also ageist. So we've got a, got a complementary study. They're all, they're all ageist as well. You know, we're not young, dynamic, blah, blah. Um, um, so these are problematic in our community. And you've given the examples of the sort of, um, you know, ones that sort of are insulting to to people who have suffered from slavery or their, their ancestors and so on have. And there's, there's a number of others as well. Um, so I think there's issues around the terminology we use when we're building the software. I'm sure it crops up in AI and data science and stats and so on as well. Um, there's also problems when we manifest it to the user. So I've given some examples here. If I'm using, say, some cultural idioms that to me as a person who grew up in New Zealand that are fine, but to a number of people around the world are, are just plain insulting, if not, you know, just like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Um, that's going to be a real problem with engaging that audience, perhaps even them using my software. Um, again, if we're delivering services to, to vulnerable people, so again, on our little initial slide, one of our interests is how do we better serve the more vulnerable people in society through building better software? Um, if we're using jargon and terminology that kind of, again, makes them feel disempowered and disconnected, does, doesn't support them and so on. Um, these have real um, serious consequences. Uh, we do a lot of work in e-health and an e-health software that, again, doesn't support and, and really understand its user base ends up, um, again, being possibly harmful, not, not, even, not even not helpful, but harmful. Um, and so some of these, these consequences of our poor use of language and our, our, our misunderstanding people, if you like, or not having sufficient empathy uh, with other humans, uh, other people, um, is that we produce harmful software. Great, thanks, thanks John. Uh, Mark Howard has another follow-on question related to you know, what happens if we let people build their own stuff? Oh. Um, you know, what about shared responsibilities and actually who is responsible when something breaks? So Mark, over to you. Yeah, so um, like Joanne has summed up fairly well there, just this notion of, you know, this being inclusive in design of this stuff sounds like a great idea. Um, but where does responsibility then um, uh, end up? Uh, is there a possibility that we start shifting responsibility away from providers and developers and actually placing it on persons and end users? So. Just your general thoughts. And e-health is a, a classic one for that kind of question. So. Yeah, look, it's a great question. So when I became an engineer and I came late to engineering, sort of one of the things that uh, in the in the engineering ethics is you don't practice beyond your envelope of experience. Um, um, and as soon as you give end users these kind of tools that really go well beyond their understanding of things, um, then, uh, you know, Whose responsibility is when it stuffs up? Now, on the bottom item, I'll go back to that PhD student, um, recently finished one, the deacon on this um, non-deterministic AI software that people have started using, thanks to all these convenient cloud services. 
Um, we discovered, you know, a very large number of the users of that software simply do not understand anything about the underlying models, the model training, the um, limitations of the models and, and so on. Um, who's responsible for then the software that they produce failing? And some of the software they produce like car collision detection systems, so it's, you know, safety critical, security critical kind of things. Um, and I think this, again, there's sort of, I don't know if ethics is the right word, but it, um, it is that sort of professional practice issue. Um, the example I gave of the generating the obesity app is kind of cool on one level, but uh, and we did actually work with the population health group at the University of Auckland on that on that project, um, but that was a major concern that was was raised. In fact, that that the clinicians that were doing that kind of go well beyond their envelope of experience um, and giving someone an app, for example, you know, they didn't go to medical school to learn how to give people apps to manage obesity and so on. Um, so on, on one level, it was kind of cool to do these things, but it opened the floodgates and, and perhaps all the fish hooks and broken glass for, you know, when something does go wrong, who does the who does the problem come to? I guess, I guess in the AI realm, you know, if the car runs over someone on the street, you know, who's responsible? Is the person because they walked out at the wrong time? Is it the, the person who's driving but not driving? Is it the car provider if it's a if it's an Uber type you know or rental car type thing is it them you know the, the road people um it's it's a real challenge with a number of these um a number of these domains and end user computing is, is another one great thank you thank you john we've got about five minutes left was there anything else you wanted to cover from a from a story or content perspective um well, I'll otherwise i'll you, go for another round of questions i'll give you the last um the last um thing here which is the end user uh, defect bug fixing so so again i, I pose these uh, uh, most of them are questions and answered is yeah how do we support end users in reporting problems with their software particularly ai based software just going back to that that previous question really um how do we allow them to tell us there's problems with it and what are the kind of problems? How do we make them human centric? So we've got a pro project, look at all the defect reporting tools and bug reporting tools are actually incredibly unusable for most people. Um, um, can, they, can the AI figure out its own issues and fix itself? What happens if it fixes itself wrong? Going back to the previous question, whose responsibility is that? Um, how do you get these data science people and software engineering people to understand people better? Um, um, how do we fix the problems? Can AI help us fix problems? Um, how do we give end users feedback the problems fixed? Do they believe us? And what happened, you know, again, we'll go back into that, but what happens when the models change? Um, so I'll just give you one little example of work. This is actually an interesting one, I think, um, where um, it's actually defect prediction. So I'm, de I'm predicting a defect in this line of code. Um, here's a visualization that we've generated from a model. It's giving, it's telling the developers it thinks it's defective because of these reasons, you know, different characteristics of the code base. And here's a suggester. <laughs> so it's a, it's a software, it's an AI based software tool for software engineers. Here's some things you can do to decrease the risk of defects. And here's some things you can do to avoid increasing the risk. Um, so there's an there's a AI based model that we've tried to give to software engineers to help them understand um, the, the very large research realm of defect prediction, which is a, a you know, use a whole bunch of machine learning. Um, techniques. So we've done an empirical study of that, going back to an earlier question, with um, quite a number of developers to get their perspective. Would this help you? Could you have these results actionable? Do they explain the defect model um, appropriately? And so on. And I think in, in all AI-based software, um, um, these kind of issues crop up. You know, how do we fix the problems that manifest? Um, how do we make it explainable? Um, how is it actionable? Um, and, and kind of it's, it's melding those two areas um, of, of software engineering in the traditional sense, but now with, with very non-deterministic um, uh, models in that software, which is which is uh, used to be very unusual, but now it's become very common, and we don't really have the tools and techniques to, to do it. Yeah, thanks, John. This, this piece is fascinating to me. This was a big part of my life in my prior job in industry was around I mean, your, your focus or your example here was around uh, identifying defects in your code and writing the code. One of the other aspects is, can you use AI from an AI ops perspective, which you had on one, I think your traffic slide to say, you know, can you actually use the AI system to learn from all of the error reporting messages that come, come out and get into a mode of dynamic fixing or dynamic resolution during runtime not just during design and build time of the code. And so there's a whole interesting space 
in the context of AI related operational management um, that gets into really how do you how do you change the way that we run systems and how much would we trust AI bug fixing or AI problem determination remediation actually to remediate the problem. And so that jump that sort of gets you into a whole other dialogue around can we trust, can we trust the system to fix the system? Which again, so this is this is um, I mean, it's, um, we've, we, we've called it self healing systems. There's been a kind of a little uh, cliquey group that have looked at many, many, many years. And um, again, with these sort of yeah, more, more available and powerful AI techniques, there's interest in doing that. Um, if I put the human lens over it again, if it's trying to fix it for a human, um, can we trust it to understand again how much depth does it need to know about? And, and it, you know, different humans will have different bugs. Okay, your bug might be different to mine because you know your eyesight's better than mine, or your your experience frame's better than mine. So you understand the jargon or something, or that you've got more experience in this domain for solving the problem. So um, one of our issues here is persuading software engineers. It really is a problem um, with some of these human um, defect aspects. I think we'll have exactly the same problem, but we do have the same problem persuading software engineers is a problem because of AI defects, because um, they don't understand the AI at all. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, John, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you can tell from the questions, there was quite a lot of interest here and we really value this dialogue around provocative questions and, and also taking a different perspective of what it means to engage here as a community around data science and AI. So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who joined us, uh, VJ Paul will send you out a quick survey and I promise you it's short, five questions. Um, please respond. We're looking for ideas and feedback as well as content and topics for future meetups. That would be really great. Um, then also we do have this Monash Data Futures Institute affiliation network. Probably many of you got the invitation today to join us through our existing membership lists. Some of you may have been invited along by your friends and colleagues, uh, but we'd encourage all of you to join the Monash Data Futures Institute. Uh, keep up to date with some of the activities and events that we have planned. And again, right in the future, we really hope that this will become a more traditional meetup where we're actually meeting real people in person as opposed to faces in a Zoom meeting. Uh, but we really appreciate all of you joining this experiment with us as we look at new ways of building a dialogue together that is not a typical seminar series. So we really value the feedback on the format. Uh, Vijay's dropped a link in the chat for how to join the affiliation program. But a big thank you to John and thank you to everybody who joined us today. And we hope we'll see you again in two weeks time. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. We'll see you all. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, John.